morning, good morning. This is your Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. It is me, your host, with um, no disembodied voice today as he is working on the studio at Reaper. So Justin is is kind of watching us from afar but is not uh, directly involved. We have no disembodied voice. And uh, Kiwi, who is more or less crashed out next to me. How y'all doing? And I'm gonna also like drop my phone on the floor. <laughs> oh, and something I didn't get a chance to tell Justin, I'm gonna tell you guys like right now, and I'll uh, I'll tell Justin after the stream, but that I will not be able to stream on Wednesday. I have to take Curie to the vet, and they only had a morning appointment, so I have to I have to go into the doggle um, and make sure she can. Hey, Curie Michael Cosme, good morning, and thank you for the resub. Yay, five months. Hey, Trixie Kitty, how's it going? Alrighty, I'm gonna do shiny boots today. So those of you who are watching my private personal stream on uh, Thursday, you saw me do some shiny boots. We'll do shiny boots with a different color. Let's see here. We have we have Alethea. To this week is uh yes. <laughs> so this week is gonna be character week, guys, because last week I worked all on monsters. So I would like to have character week this week. So we'll work on Alethea, and I'm gonna work on um. A couple of new models, probably. I've got a bunch of stuff that I ordered from Reaper and uh, the pirate uh, Captain Fairweather from uh, ReaperCon, who is primed, so I may work on her, because hey, pirates. Um, Trixie, she may not be. It's old dog, and we're going to see, but I don't want to talk about it. I don't like to dwell on it. Keep you guys posted, because I know you like Kiri. Um, but yeah, she is, she is definitely old dog. She's not eating very well, so we'll see. We'll see, but yeah. But she is looking pretty happy here. She did eat a few bites of her breakfast. She squeaked her ball once and then laid down, so. Hey, <laughs> Kiri is more important than streaming. Yeah, I have to admit you're right. So let's get our happy thing. Hi, Freestyle. And uh, it is like, there we go. Oh, so anyway, it's a day. Did you guys hear that we might have a COVID vaccine soon? David was reading me uh, coverage this morning that, uh, as I think it's Pfizer's test, had over a 90% uh, success rate on their latest small study. So thanks for the loves, guys. Thanks for the loves. Kiri's awesome. Yes, I know. There won't be another one like Kiri Dog, that's for sure. All right, let's see here. What do we want to do for the, for the boots? Normally I do a bluish, a bluish tone, but we've already got a teal. Maybe I'll do a purple. Maybe I'll do like an indigo. Hmm, that's a good idea. Like, let's see here. What can I use for this? Technically, you can make a shiny boot with almost anything. Let me see. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? Hmm. Kind of looking around seeing what I got. I mean, I could use ultramarine shadow and add a little purple to it. Yeah, Crowley Hunter. Hey, it's good. It's good. Yes, yes, I'm going to make shiny boots. I made shiny boots. Uh, I did a bit of shiny boots on my stream on, for D&D &D, uh, last week. And we used Nightmare Black for that. I actually really liked that. I was working on those. So uh, I figured maybe today we'll use a slightly different color. It's nice when you can use something saturated if you want to suggest um, if you want to suggest the sky. So you're using like kind of a blue. Uh, it can help to use something with a bit more punch in it. Um, or if you want something that's more subtle and more close to black, just black, and you don't really want to have another color, then you should really just use a black with maybe just a little tiny blue gray. I guess I haven't done that for a while. Maybe I should do it that way. Just use pure black and use my ashen blue. So if you want something that looks a lot more black and you don't want to suggest a color that's being reflected from sky or anything, then I still do use a little bit of a, a bluish color, but I'll use ashen. Yeah, the bard is, uh, she's really coming along. So, like, Kariniko, if you ever, I don't know if you can tune in for my afternoon stream on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but she is our first player character, and she is really coming along now, so I am liking her greatly. I decided that her black needed to be worked on, and in the process, I discovered that by using Nightmare Blue with the black, 
I could get this blue here, which then I could use for an accent color on her mug and on her sword and probably on her tambourine case or this little pouch on the back here. I'll be adding the blue back here to repeat it around the model. So yes, on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the D&D stream, we are working on the bard. Although, you know, she's getting closer and closer. I'm thinking about swapping off to a different character soon just to get paint on a couple of, cu couple of different characters. Um, so yeah. All right, so I think I'm going to use, since I've been using a lot of different brighter colors to do shiny boots lately, I'm going to go back and go to my more traditional way to do them, which is actually using pure black. So let's get that one. One. My pure black bottle is very, very close to empty. I'm going to try to squeeze four drops out of it anyway. Actually, I got six in that particular well. And then I'm going to try to mix just a little bit over here. It's very strong, so I just need a couple of drops. I probably need to unclog it because it's... When a paint bottle gets so close to out of paint, it t it's got so much air in there that it does tend to clog a little easier. So nothing is wrong with your paint at that point. It's just that sometimes you need to give it a little bit of encouragement. So I've got a puddle of uh, pure black, which is about six drops right now. And I've got two drops laid out here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix this, uh, whatever color you want to start with, I recommend mixing it with a little bit of black, especially if you're going to go up with like an off gray like this. Um, Justin has had a numerous uh, days where he's had to start the show from his phone planner. Um, and the reason for it is just that he's at the studio and he doesn't have it set up yet. So he's not working from home with his full setup. And so he can't, he can't be on voice. Until the studio is set up, which hopefully, you know, will be set up later this week. So I'm going to put about one, two, three, four drops of my Ashen Blue in there. So I'm using a bluish gray because, again, I like to, for one thing, I use this color, if you remember, on the armor. So it makes sense that if we're going to have sky reflection on the armor, we'd have the same color on the boots. And it will give us um, less of a flashy boot color, more of a natural boot highlight we can still make it shiny it just won't be quite as eye popping as using a more vibrant color because i mean you could use almost anything to highlight black when it comes down to it and it'll either suggest environmental reflections or it will suggest um like uh that that, that the boot is actually like a near black so for example if you used red a bright red to highlight your shiny black boot um, what would, what would end up reading probably is that the boot itself was like a red black. And so that's why you're getting some of that red in the highlights, unless you're like using a red light source everywhere, then it would read correctly, but that's what you're dealing with. So then we definitely also with anything shiny, you must take it up to pure white. Yeah, I did not do anything. You usually watch it. Oh, but, but lurking, right, Kariniko. So like the boot that we'll get, the color and the highlight of the boot that we'll get for her then is not going to be quite as uh, poppy. You see how much blue I've got in there and it's a very strong blue because we were using Nightmare Black and Nightmare Black has a very strong blue highlight. Uh, when you add white to it, it goes very bright blue for what it is, for a black. <laughs> four drops of white, four drops of ashen, and I need a bottle of my water which is getting low. It's a good thing I have a backup bottle of water. I think I'll just switch those out right now. New bottle, fresh bottle full. Yay. I keep several. I'm just like, because I'm lazy and if I'm going to reload them, I want to reload them all at once. So I have like four bottles of water. All right. Uh, two drops in the black. I'm going to just start with a two to one on everything. Now I put up, uh, for those who are my patrons, I put up a post last night that I think is going to be extremely useful to you. Um, I did focus in a lot, so I wandered a bit on my camera from sometimes, but the information is really useful. If you're starting to work with, a lot of you just bought well palettes and you're starting to work with thinned paint and it shows you how much you have to unload your brush using various sizes of brushes and two different paint consistencies. So you can see how much you have to unload your brush. And it's a lot more than you think when you start using thin paint, even using a two to one and a two to one is what I'm going to be using today. Um, pardon me while I clean up my palette here so this paint doesn't dry and is hard to get off since I had an errant drop of black there. So if you're on my Patreon, it is the $2 video, so it is super cheap. If you're not on my Patreon, you can totally join for 2 bucks and get it and all the other $2 videos I've done. 
and even some $2 PDFs from last year. I tend to go for videos more these days for the $2 tier because they're a little bit faster for me to do. With PDFs, I tend to write long, and so I tend to put out pretty long PDFs, and uh, it takes a long time for me. So lately for $2, it's more efficient for me to do a video. It's a nice short video, too. It's only about 17 minutes, so it has a lot of info packed into that. So we've got kind of this medium gray. I may need to add a little bit more. You For your starting highlight on the boots, you really do want it to kind of blend. Phone keyboard, yes. Yeah, if you want more paint information, the $5 tier is where to go. And that's uh, patreon.com slash painting big. That is my, my sobriquet, as it were. I think that's the right word. All right. I'm actually adding even a drop more water to this, so it's even thinner. There. And then down to the white. Oh, good, Ash. Good. I'm, I hope it helps you. Yeah, it really shows you how much you've got to... I talk about different brush sizes, too. How much paint you can get onto them, how they impact how you can paint, um, what they're best for, you know. There are definitely ups and down sizes to different sizes of brush. So I go for I go with my largest brush that I ever use, and I talked about my smallest brush that I ever use, and then the other one that's in between. So it is super, super useful. It is like peak life hack, paint hack uh, information on that video, guys. So yes, if you are not a patron... Like I said, two bucks. Two bucks gets you that and all the other $2 things I have ever done. And there are a lot of $2 things because I've been doing this, this since December of 2018. So we are almost at our two-year anniversary, which is crazy. I had never thought. All right, so our, our strategy here with shiny boots. You have to start with something that's fairly dark for your first highlight because you do want, you want to give a transition. Like if you tried to just highlight black, with the ash and blue, it would be very difficult to make them, to get a really smooth transition, right? Because they're so different, right? You'd have to thin this to the point where you had to build up so many layers of it, it wouldn't work very well. So you do want to start with something that you think you can make blend with black. So something that's actually quite dark. And then from there, that's your stepping stone to go up to here. And you may actually choose to do like a little spot blend of, uh, of the two together. For example, you may grab a little bit, you know, of your ash and make something that's in between. You could even mix that in a well if you wanted. If you're new to layering, you may want to do five layers. Um, but uh, the more the more transitions you mix, the easier it's going to be to get your stuff to blend, guys. Uh, no, the uh, brushes. Okay, so I actually don't use Winsor Newton Series Seven, John David. Um, what I use is, I'm a DaVinci Maestro girl, actually. I love DaVinci Maestro. They are what I used for 20 years for competition painting. And recently, only very recently, only this year, have I come around to the Raphael 8408 size one. That's my biggest brush that I use. I'm using it today. I've gotten really into the habit of using it. The reason I like it is that it holds so much more paint that I can paint a lot longer between brush reloads. Um, so then the other brushes that I use, here's the, these are the three brushes I use in the video, guys. So Da Vinci, Maestro, I've got a size one and a size triple aught. They are both series 10, which is their standard round. And uh, so this is my progression. These are the three brushes that I use. That's my size progression. So as you can see, you're losing about half the brush every time. So like this one, this one, this one doubled equals this one, this one doubled equals that one. But notice that they all are quite thin. They all have a super fine tapering point, And that's what I look for. Like that's what my style... That's what I go for with my style. Because I use so much very, very thin paint, um, it just works better for me to have a very thin brush. If you have a thicker brush that with more body and less of a tapered tip, it's going to work better for you if you're working with thicker paint. I talk about this in that video. So here we go. Let me grab my brush back. You know, I could use tiny brush. We're only doing boots, so we're doing small spaces of boots. I can use my tiny brush instead. I just tend to grab for the Raphael these days because I've got it exactly dialed in where I want it. Like, it's broken in perfectly. I could, it's, it's a competition brush at this point, so <laughs> I could use it. I can do anything with it. Um, sorry. Right, so I've got this thinned about two to one paint to water. So it's quite thin, but because it's got black in it, you can see that it actually still covers pretty well. This may not actually be thin enough, but I'll, I'll drop a brush. I'll drop a drop of water in it. If my gut says that it's not quite thin enough, then my gut is usually right at this point. Yeah, no problem. Yay! Tier 1 <laughs> Thank you for the gift sub, Margaret. Ash, you, you're now a sub. 26 subs. 
Hey, movie. Yeah, I've been working on this one for a while. Thanks. I'm glad you like her. So let's see here. We're doing shiny boots. So let us, I think I've got our, so having dropped that extra water in, still pretty strong. We'll see how it goes. So this is the thing. We, we, we do want it to be fairly strong because we want it to show when we do this first highlight, but we don't want it to show too much because we're trying to get it to blend in, right? So that we can start our shiny boots. Let me move this white thing out of the way. That'll make it easier to see the black. And let me get a little bit closer and make sure that we are in strong focus. One second while I get her nailed there. All right. So that now let's tackle these boots. Now you guys can see a little better. I'm going to load up my brush. And we're going to kind of do little lines going down the front. So you see that highlight? That's about perfect, actually. It's dark enough that it's still blending in, even though the paint is a little thicker. So the key to blending, you guys, other than very little paint on your brush and a brush with a very fine tip. You can see how micro my tip is on this. Um, that's why I love Da Vinci, by the way. Uh, but the key is, if you're using colors that are very close together, you don't have to thin them as much to get a smooth blend. But when you're using colors that are very far apart, you have to thin more. So how you choose to do this is up to you. Like when John bon Bono, my kind of protege, John worked for Reaper a while, long, long time ago, I guess. Um, and he still was teaching at ReaperCon up to a couple years ago. But uh, John, when he was first trying to layer... Would, would do like a seven transitions. Like he would do like, you know, seven colors getting gradually lighter um, as he worked with his layering. And what that meant is that he didn't have to thin the paint as much so that he could concentrate more on how to get the transitions and the brush strokes. And then he would go, you know, then he could work his way thinner and thinner as he got comfortable with that. So how you choose to do it is up to you. So that's a very subtle highlight you can see on that boot. John David's just not worth it. Like we, I mean, we've got a Kalinsky sable. It's actually, I like to, I like our, what we decided to do. Um, the, okay. So here I'll, I'll give it to you straight. Cause I actually was at Reaper when we were doing this. It's very difficult to find a top end sable company that will re rebrand your label. If you're not going to buy a crap ton. And I mean a mega crap ton and Reaper cannot afford to throw, you know, money into 20,000 sable brushes. Like we normally order in thousands, you know, that kind of thing. That's the scale up that it requires and they're expensive, right? So we ended up working with a company that instead of a grade one sable would do a grade two sable, but would actually, um, would actually, uh, re reprint the barrels, right? Um, and, and would do small amounts for us. And so what that results in is a, still a very good brush, much better than a Taclon, but, uh, but a brush that is actually a little bit more financially accessible to a lot of gamers, which is where, you know, Reaper's audience tends to come from. So instead of paying 16 to $18 for a Da Vinci, they're going to pay, you know, 10, $11 for a Reaper Kalinsky, which is much more accessible if you're coming from the six to $7 a brush. It's just a little bit of a jump and you end up getting a brush that's going to last a lot longer and do a lot better than your average Taclon, which is the rest of Reaper's brushes, right? So... It's okay. You're new and you do not know. So now you know, because I worked for Reaper for 17 years. I'm still working for Reaper. I'll have my 18 year anniversary if I'm still employed by them in April, assuming that Twitch doesn't blow up. Um, I will have my 18 year anniversary in April for work of working for Reaper. So yeah, um, it's just, you know, when you see, when you see a company and you're like, well, this is a no brainer. They should be doing this. There's usually a reason that the company hasn't gone into that. Everybody thinks Reaper is much larger than we actually are. Like we're always kind of amused when people come on tours and they're like, wait, how many employees do you have? Only like 25? I thought you were like, you know, a huge company, that kind of thing, right? Cause we're all over the world, but we do a lot with a smaller workforce. Now we've gotten a few more employees. Now I think we're up to 50, but it took a while. Yes, I am. Yeah, John. don't worry about it, John David. I, I interact with chat all the time. I am always looking at chat. I am always answering questions. When I don't have any questions, that's when I talk and paint. So that's what this show is indeed about. Yeah, happy 17 years, right? Yeah, long time to work for a company. So it should tell you how good of a company to work for a Reaper is, guys. Yeah. Yeah, John's good. He's full of little little life hack tips. 
He hasn't had a lot of time to paint recently, which is why he hasn't been teaching at ReaperCon. <laughs> the Reaper, Reaper Twitch will blow up in the good way. Yes, I, I will persist in believing that. Yeah, exactly. Ed spends it all on cars. That is, that's likely, <laughs> John David. You could have nice brushes, but instead, Ed gets a new Mustang. <laughs> He's going to want to kill me for saying that. Don't get me in trouble, John David speaks. He's my boss, you know. He was my boss for many years, and he uh, he has a sense of humor about me, hopefully, by now. All right, so now we're going in with our Ashen Blue, guys, 9057. It was my favorite color, uh, honestly, to do, like, sky reflections with. If you're going to do reflections on NMM Steel, for example, um, obviously you can't use it very much on gold because gold you're going to go up with yellow, and if you introduce a little bit of blue into that, it's going to go really gray and green and weird. Um, so you have to do it a little bit differently when you're doing with gold. But if you look carefully on this blade, you can see that I actually have some Ashen Blue in there it mixed into the gray like there's definitely a section here that's very blue um so i'm being very consistent here i'm i'm doing the thing i always tell you guys to do which is to repeat colors over the course of the model don't reach for a different color if you can reach for the same color and the reason is that it makes your whole model look more cohesive right it makes everything kind of work together a little bit better because even though you wouldn't notice that you know these are the same colors unless you looked very very closely and we're analyzing it for that reason um your eye picks it up like your eyeball will pick up that, oh, that's the same colors. And to your brain, that'll say, oh, that's a very harmonious model. And you won't quite know why you're getting that, you know, idea until you really look at it. Morning, Val. Yeah. 700 subscriptions. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, but who, who's mom and who's pop then? Twisted Oma. <laughs> brother and brother business. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Ed is very like that. Eddie, Ed is a straight shooter. Like, a Clint Eastwood is not a bad comparison. Um, the reason I always got along with Ed is that he's really straight up. He's straightforward. Um, and he'll tell you what he thinks. And he won't pull punches, you know. And so there are times when you get irritated about that. But in reality, we should all be happy for that sort of personality in the world. You know, somebody who's not going to always be talking spin to you. Um, so... Yeah, it is as a good guy. He's a really good guy. He was a very good boss. Now that I'm working remotely, I don't uh, get to walk into his office and yell at him. But, you know, <laughs> he's probably really relieved. <laughs> it was probably the best day in his life when I when I moved to California. And he's like, oh, thank gosh. Anne can't walk into my office and yell at me about something. I'm sure somebody has stepped up to the plate and, and become the replacement Anne. So I'm just going to start blocking in. I, my pure white is way too strong. You see how strong that is? Looks like a really strong stripe um white the lighter you get in paint the more you have to thin it to get a good blend guys and that's a that shows you that right away so i usually do start with kind of placing my highlight on the top of the boot and wherever my brightest highlight on the top of the boot is that's that's the the highlight i'm going to trace down the whole boot because for shiny these are like cylinders so you treat them a lot like these greaves with a cylinder your highlight doesn't sit on top it actually goes straight down the middle and you can see that one second while i touch this up because i actually blorfed it a little bit there got a little bit too strong there all right so cylinders are like ferrules so if uh, you look at it there we go we've got highlight and shadow and they're going straight up and down now this is very shiny much shinier than say a burnished metal or a boot but you get the idea. It's when you have a cylinder here. Let me turn it. There we go to the light source. So it's like that, right? Now, the less shiny, because this is super, super gloss, right? The less shiny you get, the more this highlight's going to spread out and kind of fade. It's not going to be this pop, straight, bright, white, no other colors on it whatsoever, right? And, uh, and so that's what we're doing here is we're we're gonna keep it pretty sharp going down the front of this boot but also because it's leather there are going to be some irregularities as well right so we have to keep that in mind and kind of make a little bit of a irregular line now let me kind of trace in a little bit more highlight here now frankly if you were doing if we were doing a dull leather boot like a suede we wouldn't go much up from this we'd go just a little bit so let, actually let me do that let me do like if i was going to do a dull leather and I'd probably stipple it a little bit. I'd probably do little dot highlights because suede is soft, right? So you wouldn't have a sharp highlight. And you'd spread it out a lot. And you'd still kind of try to keep bringing the edges a little bit. 
Like you want to definitely like spend a, a little more highlight on defining your edges. So I would dot, 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 dot. So like soft boots, soft boots would be more like this. I probably would still use a little bit of pure ashen, but I'd use it like near the edges so that I could bring out details. You could go a little bit different. So like if I was going with a soft suede black boot, that might be, that might even be too much. And that's the difference. Like the highlight is in the same place, but because it's going to be a softer surface, you won't get the sharpness. You won't get that sharp, the sharp edges and it won't go up to white. But that, you know, that would be a pretty good soft black leather boot. Uh... Um, John David, I am not designing the paint line anymore. I passed it off to Sadie. That is the nice blonde lady you know about. She was my protege and uh, chief assistant when I was still at Reaper. So I had about a year to, uh, once I started dating David and it was looking more serious, I had about a year or two uh, to train her in everything. So Sadie's very good at the job. Um, she's very talented at it. She comes from, she's a very artsy girl, so she uh, has a lot of great ideas about uh, how, to do the, how to do the paint. She's got a good knack for matching colors. She's very, very uh, conscientious about matching colors. So yeah, Sadie's awesome. Alrighty, so let's so that would be how you do a soft boot like if you were looking to go and make this more of just a softer leather or even just a leather that's not quite as glossy right if you didn't want to do the shiny leather this is about where you'd go and that would be a good highlight for black like maybe you could take it up a little bit more but at least you can see there are highlights and you know it brings out all the details those are your key things uh that you want so Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Corrupt your nephew, please, Iffy. Um, so, yeah. So, that's that's where you go. But now now we want to go shiny. So, actually, I'm going to leave this, this one soft. And then we'll go over and do this boot shiny so you guys can see the difference. Let's see here. Okay. So, let's see. I had to blend this just a little bit more. I got a little chunky up here because of that white that I put down that was really um, not thinned enough. Now, given, this is crazy, guys. This is how white is. So white, this white is thin two to one. So it's one, uh, two drops of white and, and one drop of water for each two drops of white. And you can see how thin it is on the side of the palette. It's, I mixed it up and this, this is, it was up on the sides here and it's dropped down. It looks transparent. But when you try to paint it on something, you find out very quickly it is not transparent. Like, it's actually really strong. So if you put that on this boot, it's just going to look like you make a bunch of lines and it's not going to look right. So I'm going to have to drop more water into that. I'm actually going to thin it down one to one. I still want it to be pretty strong because I want my highlight to be pretty strong. But it needs to be just a little bit less so. It needs to not be making huge white dashes all over everything. And you can mix it with your ashen blue to kind of get, like I said, a mid-range color. You can do as many 50-50 mixes as you like. Ash, I never have a problem with my paint not looking chalky. Um, if you are, if you're getting chalkiness, chances are you're thinning it too much or you're not using Reaper Pure White. If you're using Reaper Pure White and you're getting chalky, you have way too much water in the paint. Back off on the water. Uh, make sure it's all uh, also very, very mixed up. But I, I never have a problem with this color going chalky. Not ever. Sometimes I have like some off whites that are very light go chalky, but Pure White, never. Hey, there are much less wholesome hobbies to get hooked on, Ify. Just tell her that. He, he could do something, you know, even more terrible than miniature painting. <laughs> get him into something that's uh, at least, uh, you know, fun and creative. No parent should be mad about their child getting hooked on miniature painting. They should be thrilled. Sure, it can get a little pricey, but you can do it smart. It doesn't have to be pricey. It only gets pricey if you let yourself go crazy over Kickstarters, <laughs> as I have done this uh, last half of the year.
I have totally uh, gone too much into Kickstarters this last part of the year. But now I have all these awesome presents that are going to show up next year. So I can't completely, you know, be sad about it. But I definitely, my wallet is very much crying out in pain and I have to stop. Um, so, all right. So now I'm bringing this, this up with uh, a little bit of my ashen blue. I did mix it just a tad with, um, with the gray that we mixed from the ashen blue and the black. Because again, I want it to kind of blend. I, I need it to spread out just a little bit. If I was making real patent leather boots, like really super shiny, I would be doing more what I did with this lady and going very, very stripe down the front. But if we want a shiny boot, but we don't want it that bad, then we actually want to blend in a little bit more. I am going to keep my highlight very much on the front of the boot. The light, you can see where the light is falling by where I put the highlight on this greave. So we have to be consistent as we bring our highlight down from the boot to the greave. Yeah, we tried to make it very affordable, John David. That's been a Reaper uh, aim and goal for a very long time. If you talk to Ed about the be the old days, they really were trying to make the keep the hobby affordable, right? That was how... They put out good miniatures at a fair price, and that's why they got people looking at them. I'm just going to pull in some of this ashen blue. Now, if you go overboard and you think you've covered too much of the surface with your blue, it's not an emergency. Although right now, you can see the difference, right? Like, if you see, like, your soft highlight, that looks like a good highlight until suddenly we have more highlighting over here. I'm still having a little trouble with this top edge, so I'm going to grab some black and really hit that because I'm, I'm wondering if there's a little bit of an irregularity in the metal there that I missed because I keep kind of sliding off that top edge. Yeah, it makes future, uh, future gift ideas very easy if you're a miniature painter. As long as you know what they like. That can be rough. I had to, I had to really mess around um, to find something that David liked. Like, I, I know the kind of thing he likes, but he's... Uh, it's, it's just a little harder than you'd think, right? Some people are really easy where it's like, if it's a giant wolf monster, they want one. You know, that's like me. <laughs> if it's a giant wolf monster and it's well sculpted, I want one, generally. Um, so now we're bringing up that ashen blue. We're making this a little bit. I've, I'm This boot kind of bends over at the top, and that's why I've got that black shadow there. I might bring it up just a little bit more, though. Now, the key here, though, is if you want black boots, you have to keep the majority of the boot black. So that's why we're keeping our highlights in a very narrow corridor so to speak um the minute you start spreading out this blue gray too far the more suddenly your boot's going to look like it's blue gray instead of black so you have to be very constrained in highlighting black no matter what you're doing whether you're doing it over here where you can see i am still keeping the majority of the boot black or whether you're doing something shinier where you are punching up the highlights on the boot <laughs> That's great, Garinico. Well, you know, we're both dog people, Lady Dyer, so it's not like it's like a no-brainer, right? <laughs> we both like, we both probably love painting werewolves because we can paint them like our doggos. Although David is painting a wolf monster right now that, um, that actually I, I chose not to get. I was really tempted when I first saw it, but I had to have a heart to heart with myself because I have so many beautiful models to paint right now that I had to pass on that one. I wonder if he's got it over on his desk. Maybe I'll steal it. Hold on. Does he have Wolfie over? Yeah, he does. Do you guys want to see David's model? Here, let's sneak it out. He's he's in a meeting right now, so he can't he can't protest. One second while I steal my boyfriend's model. Let's show people the doggo, right, Kiri? Let's show them the big wolf. So... I think he's pegged on. I'll be very careful with him. But he's from Infinity, or he's from the company that does the bus for Infinity. Like, there's a company that does the big kind of painter's models for the Infinity game, miniatures game. And so this is one of their... Let me get this out. Got to, got to zoom out big time. All right, because he's big, and I'm going to leave my model in frame so you can see. Look at the mini. Isn't he awesome? Yeah, I do usually in the mornings. If you, I kind of missed it a couple of days last week because everything was so crazy. And he's, he's doing snow and ice on the baits. 
Yeah, it's a 75 millimeter giant werewolf soldier, right? So it's uh, it's crazy. So yeah, so this is David, who is my boyfriend, who is also a world-renowned painter, um, because, you know, mini painting power couple for the win. Uh, and this is the wolf that he's been working on. So he's doing a great job on it, and it's monstrous. So I don't remember. Somebody does know. If you look up Infinity 75 millimeter or Infinity Bust, um, he, actually, I'll let him talk about the snow. He actually used a combination of, uh, I'm going to put Wolfie back. Uh, he used a combination of snow products. Hold on. I don't want to give you guys like too much because, you know, he's probably going to do an article on how he did it for his blog. But um, he used a combination of uh, Woodland Scenics snow mixed into kind of a, a slurry with like a, um, you know, probably glue. I think he mixed it with PV, PV uh, a glue and then he added a little bit of pigment, a little bit of paint to it um, to color it. It may have been a little bit of De La Rowney ink, but then he also worked with uh, the Games Workshop snow product, the what's it, Tundra. Um, which I really like, actually. I really like that, that snow product from Games Workshop. It's nice and fine. Um, yeah, it was huge. Uh, so hold on, let me get down back again. There we go. Now we're back. But yeah, you can see how huge it was. So that's a 75 millimeter scale and the wolf is meant to be like 12 feet tall. Yeah, he's, there's actually a woman that goes with him, maybe 10 feet tall. There's a, a soldier who goes with him who kind of has her hand up, you know, his head is like right over her shoulder and she's got her hand up petting him. Um, and he's, Dave is still working on that piece, but, but it is like, it's meant to be 75 millimeter scale. So the wolf is more like, like 110, I think millimeter model It's it's huge. Um, no, I haven't seen the Oleana werewolf queen. I don't need any more minis. I've got so many minis guys. Oh my God. So many minis to work on. Um, and I have no time right now because it's national novel writing month. So I've been, uh, where'd my, uh Oh, lost my glasses. Oh, there they are. Um, and so I've been distracted because I have to, I have to write, must write. November is writing month for sure. All right, let's get back to these boots. Eh, that's a good start. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I like, okay, I have to say I like the game's workshops. Like there's Sterling Mud and the Valhalla Snow or Valhalla Blizzard, I guess, is the snow one that they have. Um, I really like them. I find that they're fairly easy to use. They, when you tamp them down, they stick. They're a fine enough texture that they actually look in scale on 28 millimeter. And that's, that's, you know, really important. A lot of gravels and stuff just don't look in scale. And I got really sick of it. <laughs> you finished a mini last night? Finally. Yeah, I know the feeling. I've actually been finishing more models for my streams than I have in my my own private life because I've been prior I've shifted my priorities so much. But I want to get my novel ready for submission, damn it. And so I had to do that. I'm doing that final cut on it right now to get it down to like below 90,000 words so that it's feasible for young adult audience. There we go. So final white highlight really brings up this shine, but it's gone a little bit over the top, I think. So what I need to do here is glaze. And this is where the black glaze comes in. Sometimes I'll mix a little bit of my blue into the black glaze. So if I put some black down and a couple of drops of water. So right away, you see I'm going at least one to two. I'm going to grab a little bit of my blue to mix into it. Just a little. So that's a uh, one to two. Oh, nice. Haha. <laughs> hey, manual labor in exchange for miniatures is pretty awesome, Ash. Yeah, pebbles the size of a foot image. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I do say I do like the Games Workshop products for that. I think I don't know if AK has something similar. D David tends to use a lot of AK because Seth out here, uh, who's also a great miniature painter, uh, tends to push it. He really likes AK products, but all right. So doing a glaze and I'm just painting it over the top and it drops that down. So you can see just in one coat, the difference between this top shiny part and this. Now this is just a little bit less shiny, right? So I can work with this as a glaze. I can re-highlight. Oh yeah. That makes it hard when you get new furniture and you have to move stuff around. It's just hard. Like 
I know that it's hard for me not to be guilty at myself, right, guys? It's like, and this, we all do this, right? We're, we're like, oh, I haven't paid in a days, and you immediately guilt yourself, like you guilt the heck out of yourself. I'm supposed to be liking this hobby. Why aren't I doing it? I have so many miniatures. Why aren't I painting? You know, all that counterproductive crap. But I really need to stop it because I am really prioritizing the writing this month, and I kind of prepped myself mentally that I was going to do that. So let's re-highlight with the white down here now. So bring our highlight back in. I think I went a little bit far. I'm going to minimize it. I'm going to grab some of my gray and uh, make that a little bit smaller of a highlight. You, The thing is, you need enough white for it to read shiny. But if you go overboard, then it looks weird. So that's looking a little bit better now on this side. I'm liking it. It's good. Uh, I'm going to minimize maybe a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And that's looking pretty good on this side of the boot. But you can see the difference, right? Like this is, this is most, most people would consider this a very good highlight on black. But you can go much more than that and still have it look black. So, yeah, well, and it is prioritization. I mean, I know with me it is. Like, I know I'm prioritizing the book instead of the, the painting. I would have more time for my own painting if I wasn't prioritizing my writing. So... I, I don't ever say that I don't have time for things anymore because I know very well that if I prioritize them, I can make time for them in my schedule. But it is a little hard to get out of that blaming myself mindset. So I, I feel it. It's not productive. And I always say fight against it because you really you, you enjoy it. You should never guilt yourself about something you enjoy. But let's face it, like, you know, if we really needed to make time to paint, we could. Like, if we had to get something ready for Christmas to give to our brother or our sister or our niece or nephew, we would find the time. So it really is just, like, how much how much priority you give to your hobbies. And I'm afraid that a lot of us nowadays don't give enough priority to our hobbies. Like, it's this weird dichotomy of, of like, spending hours playing computer games because you're totally stressed out and then being stressed out because you haven't made any time for your painting you know, or your knitting or your embroidery or whatever you do or your baking, right? Whatever you do as a, as a hobby that is important to you. I feel like it's just a constant fight sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I just, what I do, what I did before I moved John David is I just, I just gave a bunch of models to friends. I, I looked at my whole collection. I was honest about it. I'm like, what am I not ever going to paint? And then I just gave it away to paint clubbers. Um, because uh, I, if I'm not going to paint it, I wasn't going to drag it across country, right? Yeah, sometimes you do need some time off. That's for sure, Image of Betrayal. And everybody, that image just made a great point, is that it is possible to just get burned out on one hobby and need to take a break. And you shouldn't feel guilty about that. Like, you, if you take a break and, and you know, go and play, you know, a computer game for a while or you do something else, a different hobby, then you can come back to painting and you're all excited about it again. I mean, that's totally a thing. I notice that this hobby tends to go in cycles. So you're totally right. Yeah, we all have too many hobbies, right? I certainly have too many hobbies. And I tend to monetize all of them. <laughs> Oh, I was baking this weekend, Chibi. I was baking. Ha ha. I made, um, I made uh, Danish butter cookies and I made uh, strawberry shortcake for David, or raspberry shortcake. And I made, um, I made banana muffins, banana bread muffins, but unfortunately I screwed up the recipe. I was trying to not get them to go goopy because I've had some goopy problems in the past. Um, and I went too far the other way. So they tend to be, they're very stodgy, as Paul Hollywood would say from Bake Off. Bake Off. Very stodgy. Um, let me see here. Oh, renting a pod thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, renting a pod, empty the room, and then resort and sell or get rid of, right, Twisted Oma? That's totally the way to do it. Plus, after you empty out the room, you're going to feel so much better about the space, and then you can, like, put it back together in a way that makes sense to you guys. Taking a break with one hobby leads to other hobbies. I already have too many hobbies, so I tend to just flip around between my favorite ones. Oh, my house panther was uh, also a 17-pound house panther before he, uh, he was, when he was younger anyway. He was a big, big black kitty and his name was Panther, so. 
He was Mama-san's son, for those who remember Mama-san from Reaper. So he was half Siamese. Yeah, I mean, I've got to say the banana muffins, even though they fail completely on texture, still have a great flavor, so I'll still probably eat them with butter. They're, st they're just really heavy. Really heavy. So I, I just went too far the other way. I need to just trust my recipe and stop second-guessing it. But it's it can get really, like, it's so easy with banana bread to flip to the too moist side or the too dry side. So it's like you kind of are always trying to balance, especially because bananas aren't precise, right? So you've got bananas, and unless you weigh them, and even sometimes if you do, um, you know, the degree of ripeness is going to make a difference in how much moisture you get and all of that. And so they're, they're innately a little bit dicey. Um, so yeah, I love banana bread. Oh yeah, Square Fun Cali is totally different. Exactly, John David. We've got a, I mean, we've got a, for California, David and I have a pretty large apartment, but you know, with two of us in it and we're both hobbyists, our office is crammed. Like I would say my next goal on my Patreon, if we get to 1700 is to, uh, to actually budget some money for Ikea because I need to like revamp like this area. My half of the room needs a revamp badly. Good morning, Valandar. It's good to see you. clear pies clear pie is weird oh yeah Maine Coon is yeah Panther was just half Siamese and half uh, probably you know large Tomcat so yeah I've had to back off on my print on uh, looking at uh, thank god I don't have a 3d printer or I'd have to like you know totally shut that down too there does come a limit with me anyway where if I get too many projects I feel exhausted so I definitely have an incentive to kind of step back here and there and say, no, no more new models right now, because it just makes me feel overwhelmed and exhausted because I look at all my models and I'm like, but I want to paint all of them. And then I feel like I don't have enough time to do any of it. So I couldn't do it. You do Val. I, I, I mean, there have been times in my life, definitely. And I guess I did succumb to way too many Kickstarters this year, but that's because some of my favorite companies did Kickstarters. So, you know, so there we go. We've got a highlight on the boot now. Again, we're going to go down from the top, starting out with a very subtle highlight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of happy that we've avoided a 3D printer so far. Just take a deep breath and learn to kind of, kind of really look at a model and, and listen to your gut instead of saying, Ooh, that's cool. Listen to your gut. Ask your gut, am I really going to paint this? Or or do I just want this just to be a cool-looking model on the shelf? Which is, of course, totally, like, as people often say, collecting is not is a part of the hobby. So, you know, fair, right? Especially with how cheap 3D printing can be. So if you just want to print it out and leave it on your shelf because it's awesome, then rock it. But don't let yourself get too overwhelmed. Like, just we all have so much overwhelm in our lives as it is uh, with everything we do. So pay attention to your gut on whether, you know, or if you're going to do it, and if you do tend to be feel overwhelmed, do what I do and rehome your old, old models that maybe you don't love as much anymore. Because there's definitely like models that I would have painted years ago that I would have jumped at painting, but that right now I'm just like, well, yeah, I don't really feel it anymore. So, all right. So we got boot. Boot is going on. Ha ha. And we can put a little wrinkle here. It's nice when you've got a boot that bends like this. It's nice to put a little wrinkle there between where you've got the top of the foot and the toe. She's wearing high heel high heeled stiletto boots because she's a style and duelist and she can still kick your butt in high heels. Um, everybody loves a woman who can kick butt in high heels. Most of us women just feel like those people are fictional. <laughs> Although I guess I used to dance in two inch pumps for swing, swing choirs. So, you know, if I can do that, sword fighting, I guess yeah yeah the manicure is nice yeah the pirate ship's cool yeah I'll go back to the figurehead eventually I'm just not feeling it I wanted to keep I really want to paint characters right now I had fun with the monsters last week, though. Rock Troll, I'm excited, guys. Rock Troll is getting really close to done. I might have to actually clean him up and send him to Ron or something. Like, I still have to mail Juliana. I kind of was holding off on mailing him Juliana, both because I like to use her as an example in the videos and because uh, 
I, uh, I'm feeling like I'm going to finish something else and I may as well make Ron a present of a couple of different minis because Reaper has been so good to me over the years. So <laughs> my ankles hurt just thinking about fighting in heels. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, my dancing shoes, my swing choir shoes were pretty awesome. So yeah, they were well-made Shadow Raven. So it's a good point. Yeah, the chemicals. Yeah, that bothers me a little bit too, Kroniko. You're right. Yeah, male duelists in the 1700s wore heels, so hey, it was equal opportunity, right? It's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's equality. Alright, so now we've got some of our ashen blue, and I've got some white. So right now, remember, our highlights are very small and very spot, and uh, go just gently down the front. I usually do dashes, dashes across the boot, you can kind of see them. And uh, just keep your highlights right in the center and the tip of the toe. So that's coming along now. That's almost matched up. See, we still got that bright white highlight up here. We haven't yet brought it down here. And that means that this isn't looking as shiny. Um, we also have a lot of blue down here. So I may need to glaze and, and make it a little bit more minimalized. Yeah, I like, I haven't painted a redhead for a long time, uh, Wotan's Curse, so I, that's why uh, Alethea told me she needed to be a redhead. And I haven't done her eyes in yet, which of course David will yell at me for. Maybe I should wipe, do the whites of her eyes. <laughs> Hair is actually highlighted in much the same way as, your, as the boots are, except that you have to remember that hair is uh, transparent. They're translucent. Light passes through it. So that influences somewhat how you highlight it. Um, that I don't remember, but I kind of feel like we used... Uh, I kind of feel like we used Dungeon Dweller colors on this, guys, didn't we? Because I, everybody loves the Fire Giant's beard, and I used the same colors on her hair. So I used Goblin Skin, actually, as the base, and then I shaded it with Kobold Scale. And I think I brought it up with white highlights from that. The triad paint sets, like the triad, the core triads. Well, I made them, Ash. <laughs> I created that. Um, I did it for a reason. Because a lot of painters, when they come into the hobby, if they're not from an art background, they're really scared to mix. Like, they don't even know where to start. And that's fair, right? Because you don't understand pigment interactions. And you don't necessarily have an innate understanding of the color wheel or any of that stuff. So triads are meant to take the stress out of choosing a highlight and shadow for some of those colors. Uh, so I believe, I call them, I kind of call them training wheels. I think inevitably you start mixing more uh, as you get to paint. Because you learn that you can mix white with almost anything to make a highlight, right? Yeah, I created Reaper's Paint Line. So, like, from the ground up, from day one, I created Reaper's Paint Line. And I only stopped creating it a year ago. So, it was many years... 15 years of making the paint line. I am she who makes the paint. It's why I have a uh, understanding of paint chemistry and why I can explain some of this stuff to you guys. Now, what I'm kind of excited about, if you're looking for another Patreon, is Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda Bender, who is Bird with a Brush, Ren. Uh, Rhonda just started her Patreon, and mostly she's doing articles and PDFs right now. But she's been taking, like, she went a different way. Like, she's been taking a lot of traditional art courses, like oil painting and portraiture and things like that over the last several years. And she's getting very good. And I'm very excited to see how that translates to her miniatures. Because I think she could become a, like, a super awesome, like, as far as with light and color, I think she could really get an interesting style that's really not seen anywhere else. I'd really, I can't wait to see what Rhonda does, like... That's, that's my excitement of, uh, of somebody else's Patreon. Right now she's doing a lot of articles on specifics of color theory, like um, talking about color terminology and stuff. So if you feel like you're interested in that, but you just don't know anything about it, Rhonda explains it really well. So that's uh, uh, patreon.com slash bird with a brush. Am I right on that, guys? So if you're not patroning Rhonda, she's got a very small, easy $2 just contribute level, and she's got a $5 level that gives you PDFs for all of her content, um, which is uh, a bargain, because she does uh, exhaustive PDFs that are really, really just well, well done. She has a very clear writing style. She comes from a background of that, so it's... Uh, I would highly recommend Rhonda's Patreon. And she's a great person on top of it, so...
All right, so we're gonna start highlighting that other boot. We picked up the bright highlights on the front of this. Oh yeah, you gotta break it down, take a breath, step back, Ash. Yeah, color theory, color theory can get out of hand very quickly. <laughs> That's why I always give people two books to read. Like, um, if you're freaking out at the end of it all, like just kind of give yourself some time to detox Ash from your color theory course, then pick up two books if you haven't already. One is Color by, uh, by Betty Edwards, which is kind of a course in understanding and mixing color. And then the second one is by James Gurney, who, who wrote Dinotopia, and it's called Color and Light. And if you read those guys after you do your color theory course, it's probably going to help you internalize it a little bit better. And it's, and you can take it a little bit at a time. James, James, James Gurney's book, I really like Betty Edwards because it's more like a textbook and it really breaks it down. But James Gurney is also fun and every two page spread is kind of a mini lesson. So he really teaches it well. Like I really love the way that James teaches art. So those two books. Oh, sweet. Excellent. Yeah, Rhonda's twitching now too. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's really good. I'm glad Rhonda dove in. Like, she talked to me about Patreon a while ago. Um, and I'm really glad. Because I think that with her, with her now with, that she has a traditional art background as well, um, I feel like she's going to really have some unique things to teach, right? Really, really be uh, tackling it from a different viewpoint a bit. Which I like. I like. I like it when things switch up in the hobby and when you can get a different perspective. Because that may be just what somebody else needs to really catapult them like into the hobby and make them enjoy it is if they see a style they really are excited about and really want, really like, and really want to emulate, and they've got somebody to teach them. So now we're gonna lighten up our little uh, suede boot over here, right? Because we have our little suede boot and we've got our shiny, shiny boot. Yeah, James Gurney, Shadow Raven, James Gurney, color and light. He is, uh, he's awesome. James is awesome. I keep being tempted to invite him to ReaperCon. Like, like to like ask Ed if we can invite James Gurney to ReaperCon. Because he, he and his wife do steampunk conventions. So I know that they've got a bit of nerdery going on. And I have no idea if he even knows that we all recommend his book for miniature painting. Which would probably tickle him, actually. I should drop him a note. Because I actually emailed with him a while ago. Maybe I still have that note that I could uh, use for a contact. Give him a heads up. Also, if you really want to help James, uh, if you like him, if he's one of your favorite artists, as he is with me, I love his, co his covers that he's done for National Geographic, and I love his videos and all the stuff that he does. Um, if you want to support him directly, he does have a website of his own, and you can order his books from there. I went and ordered my copy of Dinotopia from him directly once I realized that, and he actually gave me a personalized bookmark with a with you know signed with a little dinosaur on it, and he signed his the copy of Dinotopia that he sent me, and he drew a dinosaur for me. So it's always worth giving you know uh, ordering direct from the artist. I think he seems like a really nice guy. Yeah, I see a lot of people would. Gurney's just fantastic. <laughs> Nerdery is in my vocabulary because we had a WoW guild. We had a World of Warcraft guild at one time called Full Frontal Nerdity. So if it isn't a word, it is now, you know, a la Dr. Seuss, it is a word. All right, so take our lessons from this side of the boot. Although I do feel like I need an extra white highlight there. I feel like I kind of tamped down my highlights and never brought them back to the pure white. If you want it shiny, you have to go up to pure white just in a little spot highlight manner. Need a little tiny. The spot highlight is what makes it shiny. Like that little, that little spot. Boom. That's what brings it up. Yeah, Dinotopia is awesome. I mean, and and the Gurney's, you know, paintings make it awesome, right? And they, but he's got super chops as an instructor. Like, I love, he does, he has a YouTube channel, a lot of his uh, videos that he also sells. If you want the whole series of videos, you can buy it from him uh, via self, I think he does it selfie, self lie. Um, but uh, you can also just watch his stuff on YouTube, a lot of it. It's fantastic. I love his gouache series. 
and you get to watch him work on a little project and watch how it comes together. He's just, he's so darn good. The man is so good. Now I got too bright up there on the top. It almost looks like I've got a chip of paint that's flaked off. So I need to take my black and trim that down just a little. Make that dot of white a little bit longer, not as spotty and uh, yeah, minimalize it a little bit. Yes, Color by Betty Edwards. Yep. Those are the two books. Those are the two. You really don't need more than that. Beyond that, I feel like you need to just practice. And of course, if you have access to a local color theory course, um, it'll be good for you on terminology and how colors go together. And at least uh, if you're paying for a course in person, sometimes it'll make you actually do the exercises a little bit more. Uh, it's easy when you're just reading a book to skip the exercises, but when you're actually paying for a class in person, um, it's, it's harder. So... And it depends, right, on if you are more of a, if you have higher reading comprehension or if you tend to be more of a hands-on learner. If you have a hand, if you're more of a hands-on learner, then it pays to take a class in person on color mixing or color theory. Um, but if, like me, I have a very high reading comprehension and I'm less good at learning tactilely. So I like to read it first and then I go and do it and I get a lot more out of it. So depending on how you tend to learn is the way you should tackle that. Yeah, the art makes it for you, right? Dinotopia is a simple book, but the art is really what destroys it, right? The Waterfall City art piece, yeah, it totally, that's what does it. I have a friend, Rhea, who uh, has a huge print of the Waterfall City piece from Dinotopia, like takes up part of a wall. It's really, really large and beautiful. And autographed. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, the he does imaginative realism, right? He takes dinosaurs and fantasy things and he makes them look real because he's applying light and texture and color to them in a realistic way. So that's why, you know, he's, he's just wonderful. And the fact that he's also a great teacher. You don't always get that. That's a rare combo to get somebody who is both a fantastic artist and really good at teaching what they do. So now we're bringing up this boot on the other side. See, notice that I am still keeping a lot of it black. Really, I'm just uh, focusing on highlights where the light would be directly shining down on it. And then I will also uh, do some like reflections, like there'll be places on the boot that would catch light just reflecting up from the street or the surroundings. And that's how you highlight the rest of it, but they, you'd never highlight it quite as high. Oh yeah, for sure, Villander. I mean, you can always just start with his uh, his color. I find that Betty, Betty Edwards' color book is a little bit more of a starting color book. She'll explain like the history of like colors and how we started studying color and what colors mean like for some cultures and she'll that it's a really a good book for learning to mix though. I think that that Betty tackles it in more of a traditional it's a very very friendly textbook but it is more of a textbook style whereas James is more uh, cherry picking lessons um, and uh, he's doing very short lessons. And he's not so much going into the background of color or, you know, he doesn't so much talk about stuff that's uh, like the physics of color. Like Betty talks a lot about kind of the physics of color. Like she'll go into the fact that uh, the bigger an area a color takes up on your model, the brighter it will look. So in that, that we discover that when we paint walls, right? Like when we get a color and we think it's a nice light yellow and it'll be just perfect and we put it on the wall and suddenly it looks bright yellow everywhere. And you're like, what happened? This color doesn't look this bright. And the thing is that the more of it there is, the brighter, the more that color is going to like show up in your eye. Like your brain just like sees the color more effectively. And so if you're using a very bright color, like here, this teal is looking like quite bright. Whereas if I kept it small areas, it's not standing out as much. So, and the yellow here um, is very small. So it's not, it's not uh, carrying as bright as if I had painted this whole cape yellow, which is what I actually originally had done. So, so Betty talks about stuff like that, like, like the fact that, you know, how much of a color there is influences how it looks, you know, and the fact, and she talks about contrast that, you know, a color will look lighter or darker depending on what is next to it. 
So if you put a square of white next to light blue and a square of white next to black, the one next to the white blue won't look as, you know, the light blue is going to look darker, the black, you know, and the, the white is going to look brighter next to the black because of comparisons. Colors are always relative. They shift according to what is next to them. So right now, they, like this, these greaves look totally bright on the camera next to these black boots, and the white highlights on the boots are looking really bright. In person, they don't look quite as bright, but the camera is really catching that. So, um, I think imaginative realism is more an illustrator painter book for me. Um, I find color and light is useful for both. There are some things he talks about in color and light that are more for illustrators. But, I mean, a lot of it, when he's talking about color gamuts and stuff like that, and lighting, and, and the color of light, reflections, um, that's all stuff you can utilize and should utilize when you're painting miniatures. Depending on your style, I guess. If you have a realism style. Like, James has a very... For a guy who paints dinosaurs in fantasy settings, James Gurney has a very realistic paint style. And that's where the uniqueness of him comes in, right? And I tend to also like a very realistic style, relatively speaking. But like people like Luca, who's doing our Wednesday show now, who you all should check out because Luca's a fantastic painter, he has a style that's very comic book and it's beautiful and it pops and it's just a gorgeous style. It's just very different. So a lot of this for you guys who are like, you know, not, don't, not really nailed into a style yet or are trying to develop your talents um, so that you can develop a style, you should try as many different things as you can. So you should try how I paint. You should try how Rhonda paints. You should try how Michael Proctor paints. You should try how Luca paints, you know, um, and you should experiment and see which style appeals to you and which you have a knack for and which really makes you happy. Like when you paint a character um, in that style, like what you really like. And I mean, a lot of us mess around with our styles. Um, you know, like I actually try to change up my style from time to time. Like the rock troll is a totally different style than this lady is. Um, uh, he's always nearby. So like he is very dramatic with his lights and darks and she's not, she's more my standard paint style where you can see his massive shadows and, and, you know, he's got one side of him is much more in shadow than the other. Um, and these dark shadows under the front of his legs, under his knees, um, keeping this leg really dark back here. That's not the way that I would normally paint. I would normally paint more like her, but I like to switch it up every once in a while because then, you know, I can try a new style and I can think about, Hey, is, you know, is this going to become a part of my style? Yeah, Dragon, I have run into that as well. I learned more about art. I went to art school and I learned more about art technique and how to explain it when I, when I, because of miniature painting than I ever learned in college. So I am a very much for self-taught. Like I, I personally have had the experience that my self-teaching has been far more efficient than any schooling I ever had. Because if I'm interested in something, I, I learn it so much faster, right? And so when I'm self-taught, I can just focus on the things that interest me. Um, and I, I, Dave and I were kind of talking a little bit, not so much about this, but about like education reform the other night. Because we have, we have discussions like this in our household. Um, but it was kind of along those lines where what is, what, are, what is schooling really teaching our kids nowadays, right? Is it actually useful? Um, if you watch, uh, oh, I can't remember. He's British, but he writes a lot about this and he does has a TED talk about it. But he's like, yeah, so our education system was created in the, the time of the Industrial Revolution and we haven't changed it since. You know, so we're still teaching kids like stuff that might not be useful, that doesn't teach them like creative thinking, you know, and things like that, that, that actually is so useful nowadays it's not teaching our, our like creativity is big now right being able to be a creative thinker is a huge advantage in a lot of jobs these days um whether and it doesn't really matter where you are and so but there's there's this de-emphasis on creativity still in our schools left over from the fact that our curriculums were all formed ages ago hey there liquid nebula
Yeah, Rhonda's good at faces too. So is Derek Schubert. I think Derek is actually, even though his style's less blended and more punchy, I think Derek really captures personality and faces. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that maybe I I do agree with you on everybody learns differently and they need to like kind of factor that in, right? And the way they teach. Um, or the way maybe the way even classes are split up, right? Because I mean, in my high school, say, um, you know, we had, uh, you know, you some people took physics in the morning and some people took physics in the afternoon, and if you if you like changed up those classes according to the way people learned, you could probably have taught them a lot more efficiently. Yeah, two kids. Yeah. Critical thinking and problem solving. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a it's a learning process, right, Dragon and I? I mean, some of it does come with maturity, too, and experience. Um, you know, we never learn anything so well as when we're kicked in the teeth by it. <laughs> but, you know, but at the same time, yeah, I, I just feel like like in today's world, whether you're in an office or whether you're working retail or, or you're starting your own company, um, learning to think creatively and outside of the box and to explore solutions and to not be afraid of a little risk here and there is so important. And I don't believe our schools teach that. Like you end up learning that sometimes quite late in life, in my case, you know, um, and I feel like, uh, I feel like my education wasn't worth much. In fact, I remember at one point being very bad, very mad at school and thinking, if I ever become a teacher, I'm going to teach a lot better than this. Hi. <laughs> I did not want to teach, in fact. Like, when I was in high school and college, mom was like, you should go into English. And I'm like, I don't want to teach. Teaching is the last thing I want to do. And what am I doing now? Teaching. All the time. What's my instinctual reaction to learning a new thing? Teach it. It's kind of silly. The minute, seriously, it is kind of silly. The minute I learn something new or I get a new realization or a breakthrough in my own work, I immediately, my immediate response is to run out and share it with everybody. Yeah, you feel the same about your education? Yep. Oh, wow. All three kids went through three different schools. Interesting, Chibi. Hi, Tommy. Yeah, Soltor, I, yeah, I did not have a great experience in art school. And I also just felt like I was uh, kind of like a second-class citizen in a weird way. Some of my students, like the people who were most successful in my art school were the kids who came into it with like a clear idea of what they wanted to do, I guess. And I felt like I didn't have some of the advantages to draw on that they did. Like mostly because I liked fantasy stuff, right? And that's always considered to be trash. <laughs> So, if I went back to art school now, I don't know. I think it would frustrate me just as much. Either that or the teachers would absolutely hate me. Because, you know, they'd be, like, giving me critiques and I'd be like, hey, art is for everybody and uh, it's not wrong. <laughs> Nothing is wrong, you know? At which point they would probably be why, why, like, why are you here? But I didn't learn much about technique in my art schools. I had a watercolor uh, instructor who pretty much just tossed us the paints and said, go. No technique, nothing. Like, and it's just, yeah, whatever. All right, so we got some boots. They are shiny. One side is a little bit more, I, I did the glaze on this side. And I didn't do the glaze on this side. So I think I'm going to take my black glaze and go over this. Make sure it's still good. Hey, Max Styles, thank you for the resub. Six month streak. Awesome. Yeah, especially schools are, it makes a big difference, right? Dave and I were talking, like, he had a very different education than I did. And I, like, I was all public school, and he was not. And uh, it made a big difference in both how we seem to view education. And how we, how much we feel we got out of our education. Like, because he went on to get his PhD. And I was like, I want to get out of here as fast as I can. Right? 
Yeah, there's always a couple of, of exceptional instructors, right, Dragon Eye? Like, my medals teacher was uh, exceptionally good. Uh, it was a shame I was afraid of the blowtorch till like, the last two weeks of school. But I felt like, at that point, having gotten over my fear of the blowtorch, it was like I felt like I couldn't even take the second metals class in the series because uh, I, I felt like I should retake the first one. <laughs> but yeah, so some of my instructors were good, but I just remember my water watercolor instructor. He came, he gave the impression of being stoned pretty much all the time, but in not a good Bob Rossi kind of way. Although I guess he was okay. He was likable enough, but he just never taught you technique. And watercolor is so much about technique. I need to do those little snaps on the side of her boots, don't I? And I need to figure out the color on this dagger. I think it's going to be have to be teal. Yeah, it's kind of between a teal and a teal, so it can probably be teal. I'll have to mix up that that teal again. Yeah, I enjoyed my pottery class, but it wasn't like it wasn't my medium. Like I knew that it wasn't my medium. I was I was aware enough of what I wanted to do as an artist to know that I wanted I wanted to paint or draw, like, and so I had fun with the with the pottery, but it just wasn't like it didn't speak to me as strongly as painting does. Yeah, it's true, Suro, right? Yes. Yeah, it's and it's hard, and you feel bad, right? Because I get that even when I teach miniature painting. When you have some students need a different approach, or they need more attention, or they need you to really break it down, and some get it right away, and so you end up spending a lot more time with some students and less time with others, and and you always feel like terrible if you can't reach somebody. Yeah, there's the trials of being a teacher. Yeah, it gives you a real understanding and empathy for how hard it is to teach. Like, the only teachers, that's why, I like, the, the only teachers I really, I, I had a drawing teacher who was the type to grab the chalk out of your hand, and I don't approve of that. Like, that's not, like, okay, show me what you mean, but don't expect me to do it exactly like you, right? She, hers, hers was more of a style thing and less of a, I want to show you how to do this. You know, we all knew how to use charcoal. There, getting it out a little bit better, and now I need to bring it up starkly like I did here. Just wasn't looking quite right, so I had to come back in and do it. Yeah, teachers do need way more support than they get. Yeah, Tashishi. Oh, that's really queer. Really, really weird. I got to take a nude class, life drawing. Ha! That's still pretty cool that your instructor uh, modeled for you. Yeah, Shadow Raven, have fun. Have fun, eat good. Eat tasty. Oh, today is like uh, guacamole day for me, I think. I'm eating salads all weekend. I've been making a lot of miso soup. I bought really tasty miso paste, and I've been doing uh, shiitake mushrooms with my salad because it's cold now and I want warm food. I love my miso soup. But yeah, it's teaching is not easy. Teaching well is not easy. I feel like schools don't support the teachers and that they probably get very tr frustrated sometimes in the way that they're allowed to teach. Um, yeah, there's so many things, guys. There's so many things in America that we need to work on, right? So many things across so many different areas. It's like, I don't, I don't envy Mr. Biden. <laughs> There's just so much. Where do you even start? Where do you even start trying to make changes that'll help people? Like you have to prioritize the pandemic first and you've got to really work on racial inequality, but I don't know how much the government can do on that. I, it seems like something is so, it's going to be so hard. Like, 
I don't really uh, envy anybody in government these days because there's an awful, awful lot we need to work on. Yeah, portobello is yummy, but I really love shiitakes. I love my miso soup with shiitake. And shiitake have kind of that same meaty texture. And I can uh, stir fry them in sesame oil. A little bit of sesame oil. Alright, so I think I'm getting to the point. Now I need that, that stronger highlight down the front, like I do on the other side. Because you see, this is still black, but it's not like reading the same way as this is. It's more of a diffused light. So it's giving you a softer idea that the boot is a softer leather. So this is how like just the shape and brightness of the highlights you do guys determines the texture of the item that you're trying to portray. So I need to get over here and I need to do like some very small, oh, see this is the problem with small brush. It needs to be freshly loaded to do its little, its little tricks. So I've got much more of a bright, a little bit off center, but it's still where it needs it needs to be. So I think my failure is more on the side of uh, where my initial highlight was phased out. So I'm gonna phase, so do a little bit more highlighting on this side to make that make sense. Yeah, I'm a mushroom person also. I do love my mushrooms. Yeah, a little bit better. I made a little bit too much of a line there. So it's like fine tuning at this point. It's like, okay, I, I need this to look, and this always happens to me with boots. Sometimes they come together real fast and sometimes I have to work on the boots. I mean, a lot of people like Loctite, and depending on whether I want a gel or I want something more fluid, I will use either Zapagap or Loctite. Um, Ash, these guys. Zapagap is a medium, so this is kind of eek. This is a gap filling formula, but you can see that it's a little bit more fluid. See it move? Um, so this is a medium. It's not a, you don't want anything super, super runny because often you don't have a super, uh, super snug fit. Um, so uh, the medium is about as far as I'd go as far as runniness. And then the ultra gel, this is very jelly. Um, and if I really have a lot of space to fill up, um, I'll use this, uh, you can get, you know, an, or either of them online, or you can, uh, go to like hardware stores. We'll have the Loctite. So we'll, uh, sometimes even grocery stores will have the Loctite in their utility hardware section, depending on where you are. But those are the two I use. Oh yeah, Valandar, that mush that mushroom pizza sounds great. Oh, we are almost to the point where I oh I, we are to the point where I need to talk to Justin, but our boot is almost done. I want to finish the boot, so I'm going to uh, it's it's actually almost completely done. So I'm going to do that, and then I'll text Justin, and then we'll just fine tune. And I didn't even do the back of the boots, and there's a lot more leather to do on the back. This shows you guys why it takes me 12 hours to paint a miniature. Now, given a lot of the time when I'm here on stream is spent uh, answering questions, right? So we don't always make a ton of progress, as not nearly as much progress as I would make if I was just painting alone. So I'd be going a little faster than this, but it takes time. Getting really good results takes time. So just a little bit of highlight there on the bottom. There we go. Yay! Yay! So we have the yellow. We have to shade. We have to touch up some shading. We need to highlight the yellow that she's got here. We need to do NMM gold. We need to do some highlighting on the leather. Yeah. Otherwise she's getting her front is getting really close to done guys. I showed them your Wolfie oh, very briefly. Who said you could? I stole him. <laughs> we were talking about giant werewolf models. They and probably left out the, um, Go. No, I didn't want to grab the girl because she is not done and she was not attached. So well, he's not done either. <laughs> well, yeah, but he looks more done, and he's also attached to the base, so I can actually pick him up without being afraid That's that I'm going to kill him. Um, oh, what company is that again? 
for that makes us uh, Lux Umbra for that giant wolfy thing, guys. They do the infinity, uh, the bus and larger models based on the infinity miniatures game. Yeah, it's all licensed by um, the maker of infinity. Okay. Uh, but it's a separate company. Yeah. So if you all want to look at that gigantic wolf warrior with the two guns, that's where you look for him. And they have some cool busts too. Um... Yeah, fish is a weird one, Chibi, because less is more with fish, I find. Yeah, there, Lady Dire Doggo is going to run over and check out those models. No problem, Lady Dire. I will enable everybody else to blow as much money on miniatures as I have this year. <laughs> All right, I think I will text the Justin. Are you putting things together? Do you want to show people? Yeah. Okay. okay, David wants to show you the whole thing, guys. Hold on. I'm going to zoom out, zoom back. I also left my um, my tiny miniature here in the frame so they could see how massive Wolfie was, which was fun. So let me get let me get this up a little bit here. All right, there we are. All right, here's Wolfie again. Wolfie with his friend. Yeah, here's Wolfie with Margot. Yeah, with the friend. So there you go. So obviously I haven't painted her gun. There's a bunch of stuff I'm still working on on Margot. There's, I'm still working on Wolfie's backpack, although most of Wolfie's front is pretty far along. Yep, yep. So there you go. So Luxumbra, Nomad Zeke, Luxumbra is the name of the company that's doing these larger Infinity-based models. So there you go. And I don't usually copy the box art, but for this model, I like the box art so much, I just had to copy it. Well, the box art was done by Sergio, and he's your favorite painter, isn't he? Yeah, he pretty yeah, much Yeah, so there we go. So it's like me, bo I, I kind of uh, copied a Kirill box art on one thing I was doing. The Viking. I, I wanted to do his wool texture that he did on it. Viking bust. Oh, Bryce, you almost bought that one? Yeah, I had to resist buying it, too, because I've got so many awesome things to paint already. But yeah, David's painting it. So I get the, I get the, <laughs> kind of the vicarious, I get to look at it and watch it develop, and I don't have to paint it. So, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. Yeah, all one word, Luxumbra. Thank you, Dabber. So yes, they, and they've got some nice busts. If you like science fiction, um, I mean, Infinity is a pretty cool game, and the miniatures are exquisite. Uh, so there you go. Now, now you can all run out and, uh, and go look at infinity models. I am going to text Justin real quick, guys. Here, let's get a little closer and let's get in focus. So you guys can actually, there we go. And you can look at the pretty mini and ask questions if you have any. And I'm gonna go, hey man, how about a raid? Ready for a raid. Oop, that raid. Yes, and Justin is working on the setting up the studio today, guys. So hopefully we'll finally get back to Reaper having the fancy smancy studio for episode 100. Until that point, I expect they'll just creep along in increments, right? <laughs> episode 99.6, 0.75, 0.888. <laughs> well, Dabber, you just, you, you or Rax are going to have to get together and just like try to 3D sculpt something, right? Hire somebody. Talk to Christine. Talk to Rainbow Sculptor. Ask her if she'll do a commission for you. Get some good concept art. Hire a concept artist to do your raccoon. Then ask Christine if she will sculpt it. That's the way to do it. You know, you, you give, pay money for it, but if you really want it, you can do it. Just takes cash. And hopefully the sculptor needs to have the time to do it. Yes, thank you all. Justin should be... Uh... Hopefully, it says delivered, but not read. So, we'll just keep going. But yeah, you guys can hang around for the raid uh, if you'd like. And I'm going to just kind of use my black to uh, start blocking in. Or use my, um, sorry, my light, my dark gray color to start blocking in the back of the boot as well. Now, there's some wrinkles that are sculpted here, so I'm going to pay attention to them. Whenever there is detail on the leather, like folds and stuff, definitely pay attention to that detail and bring it out. So you can see how I've put those folds in there by just throwing a, a highlight on them, right? And I'm gonna get the heel here. It's mostly gonna be a straight down, straight down highlight down the back of that heel. 
I can put a little bit of, uh, like I said, of, of slightly, um, really slighter highlights down here. Because there's going to be, especially once the, we decide the color for these squares, there's going to be reflected light coming off of them. Off of those. Uh... Oh, here we go. We are raiding miniatures right to miniatures, Dan. Okay, there it goes. Alrighty, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I love you all. Um, once again, I'm going to be telling Justin I will not be uh, here on Wednesday. Have take Kiri to the vet. So uh, Wednesday morning, maybe he'll have somebody else do it. But I will talk to you later and have a fantastic day. Um, everybody have a good one.